Hey guys, today we're going to talk about freshwater and marine water ecosystems. First and foremost, the conditions underwater are quite different than those outside of a body of water. In our day-to-day -day lives, we tend to experience a pretty big shift in weather, especially this time of year where in the morning it can be below freezing and by the time we get to lunchtime, it can be in the lower 50s. And that big swing of temperature is something that organisms on the land are used to dealing with. But organisms that are underwater deal with different things, although they are affected by water's depth, temperature, flow, and amount of dissolved nutrients. So temperature plays a role here, but more often based on what organisms is in that body of water. If you look up here, this particular picture will give you some key things about the body of water that we see. First and foremost, I want to point out photic and aphotic zone. And photic and aphotic zone, and the photic and aphotic zone uh, are, are two different regions. Photic is right up here. It is the top layer of a body of water, and here we're looking at a pond. Aphotic is the bottom layer. And the key thing to know about photic and aphotic is that if you look at the word, it will tell you all about the, the actual location. Photic kind of has photo in it, and photos need light to be taken. So that prefix photo is meaning light, and the photic zone has light in it. It's the layer of water where light can move through. And what that should tell you is there are primary producers in the photic zone that photosynthesize. And that's a very important thing because since primary producers are there, the food web is going to be supported. The aphotic zone, being aphotic, is opposite of photic zone. Since the photic zone had light, the aphotic zone does not have light reaching it. You'll notice here that they have a line on this particular graph that calls it compensation depth. Photosynthesis is equal to rep respiration. And basically what that means is that there is no net production of energy. There's not enough sunlight reaching to the line between the photic and aphotic zone to make a real difference. And once you move down in the aphotic zone, there is so little sunlight, you will not find a significant number of primary producers there. That is not to say that in the aphotic zone you won't find organisms, because organisms live there at the bottom called benthos, uh, in that benthic zone. They thrive off being kind of like the tritivores because they're going to feed off dead organisms or they're going to be filter feeders. A lot of things that you w would eat at Red Lobster are from the aphotic zone and down in the benthos. That would be things like shrimp, lobsters. In, in a normal pond ecosystem, you'd have catfish down there. There are all these bottom feeders, and, and a lot of times they, they feed off detritus or partially decomposed organisms that would have lived in the photic zone. So even though the aphotic zone doesn't have light, it's still supplied with nutrients from the living organisms in the photic zone above it. Uh, temperature in aquatic habitats also varies with depth. The deepest part of the lake and oceans are often colder than your surface water. But this should make sense, because if you're outside and you're really chilly, you would warm yourself up by walking into the sun. The sun's rays will warm you up. In the photic zone, they have the sun's rays there. And because they have the sun's rays, what we end up seeing is that the photic zone is warmer because it's warmed by that light. The aphotic zone doesn't receive a significant amount of sunlight, therefore it's not getting the energy that helps heat it up. So what we'll typically find is that the photic zone is warmer than the aphotic zone. This tends to set up a very, very stable body of water because warm water is less dense than cold water. So the warm photic zone water naturally wants to stay on top of the cold, more dense aphotic water. Rivers and streams are kind of a different bag compared to a pond. And the real reason that they're different is because rivers and streams and creeks all flow. They most of the time originate from underground water sources in mountains or hills, and they will move through a location. Near their source, they're going to have plenty of dissolved oxygen, but little plant life. So what we have here is a very large river in southern Africa and you notice that where I'm pointing out with this blue line is the headwaters and the headwaters could start with something like this where literally out of the ground a spring flows so in one location you have these headwaters start but then as it travels farther and farther the water uh, builds up it's, it's coming in from tributaries which are small rivers that flow into a larger one and these tributaries will feed it until it gets larger and larger down at the bottom, it fans out in a delta. So down here, this is its delta. The normal river flow is here, and it comes to this point. It slows down, it broadens, and it ends up spreading out. An interesting thing about rivers is that, like I said before, up at the headwaters, 
there's a lot of oxygen, but not a lot of organisms. And then as you get down into the delta, there tends to be a lot of organisms, but oxygen's in so short supply. You might think that that's very ironic, but if you think about it, it actually makes sense. At the headwaters, because there's not a lot of organisms, all of the oxygen that gets mixed in there isn't getting used. Where at the delta, where it's a lot slower flowing, a lot wider, a lot calmer, there's a lot of organisms there that are using up the oxygen. If it wasn't for the organisms being there, then the delta region would have a lot of oxygen as well. This is the basic profile you'll see in rivers and streams. This particular thing happens in the Nile River as it flows north and empties into the Mediterranean Sea. The Egyptians, for hundreds of years, depended on the Nile River Delta for farming and having that source of a good water for their crops. We also see this in the Mississippi River, that as it nears New Orleans and Louisiana, it will spread out, turning into a delta. This is a very basic example of what rivers and streams look like. Again, lakes and ponds, uh, the food webs are often based on a combination of plankton and attached algae and plants. We'll see that in rivers and streams as well, but because it's flowing in a river and stream, the attached plants and algae, they, they can't be as consistent because they're actually being moved through the water. Uh, freshwater wetlands are ecosystems in which either it covers the soil uh, or is present at or near the surface for part of the year. So what I've got in this picture is something like a marshland. You'll notice there's a bunch of grasses there. That should tell you that this isn't very deep water. And in fact, it can still be a wetland even if not all of the year it's covered in water. You, these wetlands are actually very, very important because they're nutrient rich, they're very highly productive, and they serve as breeding grounds for many organisms. There's a lot of food there, there's a good habitat there. For the reasons that I just listed about wetlands, they're very important for us to protect and for us not to just end up neglecting because they're highly important to the biodiversity of that region. Biodiversity being the different types of organisms that live there. Estuaries are a special kind of wetland and they're formed whenever a river meets a sea. And if, if you think about it where the river meets the sea, something important is happening there because a river is fresh water. It's water from rain. For us it's drinkable, it's usable, but the sea is salt water. And in an estuary, you have fresh water mixing with salt water. You end up with a gradient going on. And that gradient simply means that there are different levels of salinity. If you think back to the tolerance lab, we tested the effects of different salinities on bean plants. And if you think about the organisms that lived here, they've got to be pretty hardy organisms. For instance, at this particular location, it's highly likely that the salt water uh, will be just like ocean seawater. It, it will have the same salinity there. But if we think about this condition right here, this particular condition will be almost all fresh water. There might be some of the salt water seeping in, but for the most part it's going to be fresh water due to the, the constant inflow of the fresh water coming from there. So between the red mark and the white mark, we have a constant change in salinity to where over by the white mark is more salty and over by the red mark is less salty. And if we mix in between there, uh, this particular point will be a place where very special organisms can live, where they're able to handle constant changes in salinity. They can handle salty water, they can handle fresh water, and they can handle quick changes in between. It's a very special subset of organisms that can handle living in an estuary. Again, as you get to either side of this green line here, and here you're going to get a mixture. So over at this location is high salinity and over in this particular location you will have low salinity. It'll be much more like fresh water. As you go in this direction your salinity will increase. But as you go in this direction, your salinity will decrease. And organisms that live in there are tasked with surviving these characteristics. Estuaries, like other wetlands, tend to be nutrient rich, they tend to be great breeding grounds, and they tend to have a good amount of biodiversity. Looking into the ocean, there's a couple key things that we look at. First is the intertidal zone. And you'll notice that this picture at the bottom is completely grayed out, except for the intertidal zone location. Here is the intertidal zone. Basically, the intertidal zone is that part of the ocean's floor that during high tide is completely covered with water and during low tide is completely uncovered. Organisms that live here are regularly subjected to extremes in temperatures and water effects. So they're going to get battered by waves 
and be cooled off by the ocean, but then when the waves leave, they're going to get baked by the sun. It's a very special subset that can survive in this intertidal zone. The thing about the intertidal zone, though, is that it's constantly subjected to sunlight. So it's always got a source of sunlight, and because there's always a source of sunlight, your primary producers tend to thrive in the intertidal zone. The coastal ocean is pretty special because it's always covered by water. So tide comes in, tide comes out. It, it'll have the movement, but it's always covered by water. And what you'll find in that coastal ocean is that it gets a lot of the benefits of sunlight because it's still shallow enough to have that, it's still in the photic zone. But it ends up being protected from the effects of being out of water. And so organisms that live here will have readily access to the primary producers. It's a solid food web, and that coastal ocean is very important. Uh, kelp forest and coral reefs are two very important coastal communities. They're constantly underneath the water, and they are highly productive. They support a lot of different organisms and a lot of different food webs. If we look out to the open ocean, it surprises people that as you go out, you tend to see a lot less organisms, even though there are still things living out there. The open ocean itself will have a photic zone and an aphotic zone. But as you move into that aphotic zone, it gets deeper and deeper to where you get some organisms that have never seen the influence of light. And that really depends on where the continental shelf ends and when you really hit that oceanic crust. You'll notice this particular image shows whales, sharks, swordfish, tuna, and sea lions in the open ocean, and that's absolutely true. But all throughout the open ocean, it still depends on these primary producers, these photosynthetic organisms, these zooplankton that swim around and eat those photosynthetic phytoplankton. Again, I listed two key groups, phytoplankton. Phyto should tip you off to photosynthesis. Phytoplankton are photosynthesizers. Zooplankton, zoo should make you think animals like the zoo. And that's because they're literally single-celled animals that swim around trying to eat the phytoplankton. Zooplankton get eaten by krill. Krill are a very, very important base to a food chain. They're not a primary producer, but they tend to be the food for a lot of different organisms that lead off into that food chain. The open ocean extends outward from that continental shelf, and depending on what primary producers you have, it can have a lot of organisms in it. Again, photic zone will be supported by light. The aphotic zone in many ways will indirectly be supported by light because organisms will feed in the photic zone and come deeper, but in some cases, as in deep ocean vents, the aphotic zone can be supported by chemosynthesis. More than 90% of the world's ocean area is considered to be ocean area, and the depths can range from 500 meters along continental slopes to more than 10,000 meters in some oceanic trenches. Typically speaking, there is low nutrient levels that are only supporting small, the smallest species of phytoplankton. But still, because of the enormous area of the ocean, most photosynthesis on Earth occurs in the sunlit 100 meters of that ocean, which means that the deeper you get, the less photosynthesis. We end up seeing that the open ocean, even though they're low nutrient, because they're not supported by a lot of that phosphates and nitrates that you're able to get near the coastal and intertidal zone, we end up seeing them be very important producers for oxygen from these photosynthesizers and for the base of the food chain. The permanently dark aphotic zone includes the deepest parts of the ocean. Here you will see organisms that are nothing like anything on land or even in the photic zone of the ocean. Some of them go their entire lives without seeing the, the light of day. And they're capable of doing that because either they're indirectly supported by the photic zone, and that means some organisms swim deep and that's what they prey upon, or they're supported by some of those chemosynthetic organisms.